I got a cigarette lighter, a cough drop, a postage stamp, a slightly bent cigarette, a toothpick, a cloth handkerchief, a pen, two five shekel coins. That's only a small part of what I have in my pockets. So is it any wonder they bulge? Lots of people mention it. They say, what the f do you have in your pockets? Most of the time I don't answer, I just smile. Sometimes I even give a short, polite laugh, as if someone told me a joke. If they'd persist and ask me again, I'd probably show them everything I have there. I might even explain to them why I have to have all that stuff with me, on me, always. But they don't. And what the f***? A smile, a short laugh, a momentary awkward silence? We're on to the next subject. The fact is, is that everything I have in my pockets is carefully chosen. So I'll always be prepared. Everything is there so I could be at an advantage, that moment of truth. Actually, that's not accurate. Everything's there so I won't be at a disadvantage at that moment of truth. Because what kind of advantage can a wooden toothpick or a postage stamp really give you? But if, for example, a beautiful girl, you know what, not even beautiful, just charming, an ordinary looking girl with an entrancing smile that takes your breath away, asks you for a stamp, doesn't even ask, just stands there on the street next to a red mailbox on a rainy night with a stampless envelope in her hand and wonders if you happen to know where there's an open post office at that hour. And then gives a little cough because she's cold, but also desperate since deep in her heart she knows there's no open post office in the area, definitely not at that hour. And at that moment, that moment of truth, she won't say, what the f do you have in your pockets? But she'll be so grateful for the stamp, maybe not even grateful. She just smiled that entrancing smile of hers, an entrancing smile for a poster stamp. I'd go for a deal like that, anytime, even if the price of stamp soars and the price of smiles plummets. After the smile, she'll say, thank you, cough again, because of the cold, but also because she's embarrassed a little, and I'll offer her a cough drop. What else do you have in your pockets? She'll ask, but gently. You know, without the f without the negativity. And I'll answer without hesitation. Everything you'll ever need, my love. Everything you'll ever need. So, now you know. That's all I have in my pockets. A certain chance of not screwing it up. A certain chance. Not big. Not even probable. I know that, I'm not stupid. A tiny chance, let's say. That when happiness comes along, I can say yes to it. Not sorry. I don't have a cigarette, toothpick, coin for the soda machine. That's what I have then. Full and bulging. A tiny chance of saying yes and not being sorry. Now, suppose that instead of uh, letting Goran Dukic, the director, um, to imagine what kind of guy is this? Is he some kind of Brooklyn hipster and uh, does he get the girl or not? Suppose we let 30 kids, talented kids, answering this question. And every one of them will have his cell phone uh, um, and, or, or, or video camera and he will try to imagine the story. He will try to imagine what kind of guy is this? Who is talking? Is it really this guy? Or maybe it's a totally different guy. For example, this guy. Lots of people mention it. They say, what the fuck do you have in your pockets? Most of the time I just don't answer. 
I smile. Sometimes I even give a short, polite laugh, as if someone told me a joke, you know? If they were to persist and ask me again, I'd probably show them everything I have. I might even explain why I need all that stuff on me, always. But they don't. What the fuck, a smile, a short laugh, an awkward silence, and we're on to the next subject. The fact is that everything I have in my pockets is carefully chosen, so I'll always be prepared. Everything is there so I can be at an advantage at that moment of truth. Actually, that's not accurate. Everything's there so I won't be at a disadvantage at the moment of truth. Because what kind of advantage can a wooden toothpick or a postage stamp really give you? Indeed, we're very, very far away from Brooklyn. He could be a serial killer. We're not sure about that. He could be. That's the vision of Emily Harris and Yoni Bentovin from the UK. But what I'm saying is, if we have 30 kids, we will have 30 different heroes. We will have 30 different versions. And we would have 30 different readings of exactly the same short stories. Because what we know about the 21st century is a lot of young people do not think in words anymore. They think in images. They see things. They are much more visual than the older generations. And if instead of telling them, so Per Goriot was really sad because his daughters now discuss the motivation of Raskolnikov and these kind of questions, if we would simply let them film Raskolnikov's musings with their own cell phone, if we would let, give them the format, give them an MP3 of the reading, and tell them, OK, tell me, what does Raskolnikov really think? Please film it in the weekend and bring it on, on Sunday morning. Then I think we could really bring storytelling back again. Thank you very much. Uh, so, my name's Alan Clayton. Uh, I come from Ireland. Um, anybody else from Ireland here today? No? Okay. Um, and I work for a company called SOS Ventures, uh, which is a, an independent venture capital company. And uh, so, in terms of startup culture meets education, um, I know a lot about startup culture because we run startup accelerator programs uh, based in China, some based in the States, and some based uh, in Europe. Uh, education, well, yes, I went to school. Uh, so most of this is about trying, how do we put those two things together? So I'm just gonna throw up a couple of ideas uh, which might help you to see not only the differences between startup culture and education, but might give you some clues as to maybe how we could put those two things together. Uh, so to do that, how many of you are familiar with the characters from Star Trek? Okay, now, how many of you are so old like me that you remember the original characters from Star Trek? <laughs> Great, okay. So by the end of this presentation, it will all make perfect sense. That's, that's a good start. So, one of the things that I guess we, we all start life with is a set of intelligences. So I'm going to refer to uh, the work of a guy called Ned Herman. Anybody heard of him? Great. So this will be new useful material for you. So basically, uh, you know, we're all born physically or scientifically with the same set of intelligences between our ears. So how do we come to end up so differently? So these are the raw materials. And what that means is, so we have all these different types of intelligence. So. In theory, we can all be rational, factual, analytical, detailed, organized. We can manage projects. We can be places on time if we really need to be. We can be emotional, intuitive. We can be curious, imaginative, creative. So we can be all of these things. But the bad news is everyone is born a genius, 
But the process of living de-geniuses them. I added in the line that says going through the education process actually contributes to this process. Um, so that's a shame because if you think about it, the way, the way you come to be as you are today is uh, you were born, same as everybody else, born a genius, and then you kind of lived your life. You've made thousands of choices every time you came into contact with a person, every time you put your hand in the fire, every time you ran across the road in front of a bus, uh, you got some sort of feedback that you made some decisions uh, as a result of. You drew some conclusions about the world that you live in and about what you were going to do next. So it's on the basis of that that this degeniusing takes place. So in a sense, what we end up with in our heads is some sense of the real world, but really it's a map. And as in the picture here, the, the map is not the territory. So I could, none of you have been to Ireland, I could tell you all about Ireland, I could show you a map of Ireland, I could even show you a few pictures of Kinsale, which is a beautiful town that you really should go to sometime soon, but it's not the same as you actually being there, bumping into people, eating the food, splashing around in the sea. So we wander around with a map of the world in our heads, but we think it's the real world. And you know, as you come into contact with people from different countries, different backgrounds, you'll notice that their map of the world is clearly not the same. So that's where the problems start to arise. That's why startup culture, in my experience, is not a lot like education yet. Can we do that? This is Captain Hancock. You will divert your course. Over. Negative, Captain. I'm not moving anything. Change your course. Over. So, this is the USS Montana, the second largest vessel in the North Atlantic Fleet. You will change course 15 degrees north, or I will be forced to take measures to ensure the safety of this ship. Over. This is the lighthouse, mate. To your call. Okay. Fair enough. So several things I like about that. One is that it's allegedly filmed in the Irish Sea. Um, and so you know, imagine that the big ship is a bit like the education system, and the startup culture is a bit like the lighthouse. And as the ship's kind of sailing along, it thinks it's know what it's doing. It has huge resources behind it, thousands of men, loads of fantastic systems. It has a sort of sense of its own kind of pride and authority and so on, but it didn't expect a lighthouse. Okay, so startup culture, in my experience, is a bit like the lighthouse. So this is, the, this is the Ned Herman bit. So Ned Herman was the head of education at General Electric for a lot of years. I think he died probably five years or so ago. And all he was doing, his job at GE, was to see what could he do to educate or develop the, the management in, in a large company like that to make them superstars, basically. And so he tried to bring together a lot of sort of science about how brains work, as well as a lot of psychology about how brains work, and then just come up with a kind of simple metaphoric scoring system, if you like, to help people understand the differences, not in the types of intelligence that they actually have, but in the, type, in the different ways that they had come to prefer to use those types of intelligence. I use this a lot. And all I can tell you is that from real life experience, this is a profile uh, of an entrepreneur or somebody that you would find at a startup. So, you know, over here we have sort of left brain intelligences, obviously. Here we have right brain intelligences. Up the top you have more cerebral intelligences, which are physically more likely to be located at the top of your head. And down here we have more kind of sort of emotional intelligences and original animal intelligences that look after all your unconscious processing, fight or flight response, those kind of things. So we can have a sort of attempt, as he does, uh, to map out not really what you're good at, so it's not a skills thing, it's more like a map of values. And when we think about culture, culture is simply uh, a set of beliefs and values that are shared by a group of people. So we can add uh, individuals together and look at whole organizations on this basis. So to say, in this case, this is somebody who clearly prefers to use a lot more of his kind of artistic, conceptualizing, imaginative types of intelligence. Um, this is not somebody who would be brilliantly uh, uh, brilliant at planning 
or brilliantly self-disciplined or organized. So makes a good entrepreneur. This is the head of a school near me. This guy looks after the education of about 800 kids, aged between 11 and 16 or 17. And as you can see, what life has done to him has encouraged him to use these types of intelligence. So he is a superb administrator. You know, if he went to work for General Electric, he would have been a fantastic project manager. Be on time, keep on budget, get things done. The trouble is, he doesn't speak the language of the guy that you saw before. So there is literally, um, if anyone wants a PhD in something, there's one here. These people obviously speak different languages. So up here, you find that uh, this guy talks a lot about being innovative, blockbusting, uh, creation, looking, at, looking for the big idea. Basically, this guy wants to change the world. He doesn't have a plan for it, certainly not a feasible plan. Probably doesn't have any money either, but, but that's his idea. This guy, on the other hand, is far more realistic, far more down to earth. Uh, he knows that changing the world is not something that's going to happen tomorrow, and you can't really do it on your own. So he's more likely to talk about uh, having a plan. He's uh, going to ask the question about, do you have any money to do this? How much time do you have? Do we have resources? So this, all the conversation here is about doing things by the rules, following uh, tried and trusted principles. I'll probably get out some charts of history on the basis that tomorrow is a function of yesterday, whereas the previous guy will probably get out very few charts. And his, his key belief is that tomorrow is a new day. So you start with a blank sheet of paper. Those are two completely opposite beliefs, um, but perfectly feasible, perfectly understandable. So startup culture is like this. And just to, uh, in support of Ned's work himself, this is some uh, research done by a project called the Startup Genome Project, uh, which is kind of ongoing thing that you might want to check into. They re did re some research about within about 3,000 startup companies. And you don't need to read the detail, but basically, these people said, entrepreneurs care about building great products and changing the world. That's what they do care about. Entrepreneurs don't care about rules. Entrepreneurs care about impact and experience more than they care about money. So this is, this is startup culture, OK? Pretty scary in a school. So as individuals, um, you know, that's, that's going to be something like uh, the guy starting up a a completely reckless idea, some business that's going to change the world, a risk-taking approach to life. On the other hand, um, somebody with their feet on the ground a bit more understands some of the numbers, understands the, the real world. That results in a more kind of goal-oriented or directed style of doing things. So for here, for here, this kind of person, the result is the important thing. Getting a result is all that matters. So then you have a School head tends to be conservative and cautious. So, you know, likes to work his way through lists and so on. And down in the red corner, uh, the concerned supportive style. Now, if I was to stereotype teachers, which is a pretty dangerous thing for me to do standing right here, um, is to <laughs> kind of observe that actually teachers generally come from this part of the world because, because, because they're in the business of being concerned and supportive to, to young people mostly. Okay, so it's their natural tendency to want to share what they do, to be very sensitive about relationship type issues and those kind of things. So teaching is a kind of red quadrant activity. Uh, I do it, so that's partly how I know. So if you put a lot of these people in organizations or in schools or rooms together, you start to develop an entire culture. So if you put too many of these people together, you're going to end up with a country club. It's going to be absolutely brilliant fun. I'm staying in a ho lovely hotel by the beach. I hope to get to the beach sometime in the next two days. Uh, it's just brilliant. Uh, we're not really being very productive, though. Up here, if you put all, our on all the entrepreneurs together, it's going to be anarchy. Uh, so a bit like uh, the previous speaker was saying, you can give people the same idea, that thing about what you've got in your pockets, but everyone will come out with completely different wacky ideas, and they won't care about anybody else. They'll just go off and write their own story, pursue their own agenda, start off on their own crazy idea. And the left, top left-hand corner, you have this sort of sweatshop. So all that matters is getting the result. It doesn't really matter what the process is. 
Doesn't really matter how we get there as long as we get there. So that's not great either. And here you have something which is maybe described as a frozen bureaucracy, where everybody is playing to the rules, ticking off the things on the list, um, kind of lost sight of what we're trying to do. Um, but it sort of works. It's a bit like having a handful of weevily old peanuts that you carry around, and somebody, like the guy in the yellow quadrant, offers you a huge feast, but you have to give up the weevily peanuts first, which is not an easy decision, because these weevily peanuts have been with you for a long, long time. It's kept you going up to now. There's some nutritional value in them. So giving up them is, is not as easy as you think. So that's a couple of other ideas. Um, so what's the solution, or is there a solution? Star Trek. So for those that you, of you that do remember, uh, one of the nice things about the guys who run the Star Trek uh, spaceship is that they are a really good team. So the captain is focused on the vision. His job in life is to go boldly where nobody has ever boldly gone before boldly. Um, <laughs> And he seems to be pretty good at that. And then you have Spock, a uh, pretty objective, unemotional kind of guy, just the guy you want to have around to weigh up two sides of an argument or two sets of evidence and make a pretty rational, sensible, logical decision. So that's pretty good. And then you have Scotty, our engineer. Uh, his job, if you remember, is to make sure the dilithium crystals can take it. The captain is desperately trying to go at warp factor 11, and Scotty is paid a large amount of money just to make sure the spaceship doesn't blow up, which wouldn't be a great idea for anybody. So, so he's got his place in this as well. And then we have Bones, the doctor. Uh, doesn't know anything about the engines, doesn't have a huge vision to conquer the universe, uh, but he's really great at looking after the people. So his job is to make sure people are looked after, supported, listened to, and generally kept together as a, as a happy, positive team. So one of the things I do in, uh, in the projects I'm involved with is, is uh, where we're trying to put teams together for startup projects, is make sure that you have all of those component parts of the jigsaw together. Because if you don't have them all, uh, it's, it's not going to be great. And luckily, you know, the truth is you can, whilst everybody has their own individual preferences, you can at least be conscious of the other parts of the spectrum that you don't have. So like I say, we're all born with all these intelligences. It's just that the process of life has kind of degenerated us. Okay, so I'll leave you with that as a, as a thought. Thanks very much. I think maybe we should start by uh, letting the uh, members of the panel that didn't have the time with the uh, you didn't have to prepare PowerPoint, really. <laughs> and it's easy to uh, give their kind of uh, 30,000 feet about uh, startup culture meets education. What, what happens there at that meeting point? Avi? Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Avi Zevi. I'm a co-founder of uh, Camel Ventures and Viola Group. We are an uh, IT early stage focused fund. I'm also a board member of the Center of Education Technology and uh, look at uh, the education uh, sector from uh, the technology aspect. So when uh, coming to think about, you know, the encounter between startup and education, one has to think, uh, okay, what are the building blocks for a startup to be successful? By the end of the day, we are talking about uh, an impact and value creation. And uh, in order th for that to happen, there are certain things that need uh, to come together, as somebody said uh, correctly. So first of all, uh, we need to address a huge and a growing market. I believe uh, no one has doubt that the education market is a very huge market, and also growing, you know, especially in emerging markets where you, we see hundreds of millions of people actually joining the educational systems from, you know, the very early stage to colleges and things like that. So we definitely have a huge market. But that's not enough, you know. There are many, many huge markets. We need a disruption. We need disruption that is very fundamental in order for disruptive phenomena to actually serve as tailwinds for new ideas, for innovation, to become valuable businesses and value, uh, value creation. And uh, there's no doubt 
that we do see a lot of disruption in uh, the education system. I'm not going to count all of them, but I would like to focus maybe on a few of them. The first one is actually the users, the consumer behavior. We are now talking about kids, and actually also teachers, that actually grew up to the 21th century culture. They are digitized, they are mobile, they are looking for very live and short experiences. That's the way they live. That's the way they experience things. That's the way they communicate with each other. And that's something that actually drives a lot of demand from the users of the education system. The kids themselves or the students themselves are different from what we were when we went to school. And that's a very, very big change. Actually, the education system needs to adapt itself to this change. So that's one very, very big change. The other change is actually the privatization and the authority to municipalities to have budget. So it's not anymore just everything is controlled by the government. Everything is controlled by authorities. Actually, we start to see initiative, we start to see privatization, we start to see room for change. And not everything is controlled by the Ministry of Education. Still, but I believe there is a change there. And you know, as a startup, you have to think about emerging changes, not established changes. You have to think about emerging phenomena that actually drive your innovation and technology. And last but not least, I believe it's actually the infrastructure. You know, everybody has its mobile device in the pocket, tablets, broadband at schools, availability of computer, and many, many technologies that actually enable to bring knowledge, systems, way of education to the kids wherever they are. They can start at school and then continue when they are at home or when they play with kids, with their friends, and so on and so forth. So there are so many disruptive phenomena in a huge and growing market that there is Definitely room for innovation. Now the question is, is there room for startups? Now in order to have startup companies actually operating and creating value in this market, you need to have other, first of all, you need to have an great ideas and entrepreneurial teams. We do see today many, many people starting to understand there is something happening there and actually targeting that market. We also see second timers, some very successful second timers from other disciplines have been in the software area, in the communication area, in the billing space, actually coming to this space. And this combination of first-timer and second-timers actually is very, very important character and very important building block for successful startup community in an emerging market. So we do see that, but that's not enough. So let's assume we have a huge market, we have disruptiveness, we have great ideas, we need the funding for that market. That's a big change. We see many professional institutional investors are starting to look at the education sector, understanding the changes as opportunity. And we see both established investors like Axel, Bessemer, First and Rabbit Capital, these are established venture capital firms putting a lot of money into this space as well as specialized venture arm, new school ventures, new world ventures, land capital, and many, many, many other names. So we do see the funding. Now, you know, we as venture capitalists, we are driven by financial results. We are driven by greed. So we need to see that whenever we fund the company, there is a chance for the company to disrupt something, to grow, to become a very meaningful company. So we do see today possibilities actually to scale up and the go to market in those markets is starting to change. You know, it's a very conservative market. It's a very dispersed market. You know, if you look at the States, I don't know how many schools there are. Maybe hundreds of thousands of schools dispersed all over the world. So how do you actually bring a new idea, a new technology to the market? So using new technologies actually is a great idea. But there are other ways to actually encourage new technologies to be adapted by the schools and education system. It's actually through the users. I'm calling that over the top. Today, you can get students, you can get teachers, start using technologies out of school, through the network, at home, and things like that. And actually, they will become the change agents, the drivers. They will come to the school system, the education system, actually demand for different ways of education, personalized, live, groups, many, many things that people are used to. So they 
are actually to go, the go to market strategy is not anymore just through schools. We all know about this massive, massive market of uh, massive online education that is appearing. And many, many companies are either getting funded or are done through a non for profit organization. So there are many new ways to do. Still, scalability is a big issue. It takes time today, but I'm going, I believe that it's going to change in the coming years for educational oriented startups to scale up. We just saw a huge rounding fund of a company called Linda.com. I believe it was over $100 million, led by the Excel, but the company is 17 years old. So the company was bootstrapped, and only now that it's a big company, they got huge round of funding. So this bridge is now, this gap is now being bridged by the entrepreneurship on one hand, I believe the go-to-market scalable, scalable technologies and way of go-to-market that are becoming, starting to become very, very efficient, and the funding. And last but not least, you know, value creation. Value creation is generated either by growing a company to a self-sustained company that did distribute dividends, or by taking company public, or by company being acquired. And we do see lately several IPOs, you know, I believe in the recent year, the first thing significant was what a company called K12, but we have seen many, many other companies going public. Some of them actually selling technologies to the Chinese educational market, but it's a huge emerging market. And we have seen many, many acquisitions. Still, the number of acquirers are kind of the traditional per, uh, players. Pearson, Blackboard, Kaplan, they are the most active uh, acquirers. I believe a change there that other conglomerates, IBM, Oracle, SAP, whoever, will start understanding there is a huge opportunity there and acquiring market will create a full ecosystem. So I believe they are on the verge of a very interesting encountering between the startup community and the educational sector and I encourage you guys to really look at it very seriously. Disruption and changes, it's the start of education. Uh, my name is uh, Chaim Teicholz. Um, I'm um, coming from the technology side this time. And uh, I'm an entrepreneur, so I had my own startup company, which was acquired by, uh, by a large company, by uh, Lucent, which became later an Alcatel Lucent. And right now, I'm the CEO of Alcatel Lucent here in Israel. So I actually joined uh, the evil side uh, of the big companies. <laughs> Uh, but I also had the pleasure to be on both sides and from one side to experience uh, the startup culture, the internet entrepreneurship, and uh, from the other side, the big organization which really make things happen. What is really interesting is that um, here in the interaction that we have, uh, that I have with uh, Mindset and the people here, um, I learn about a completely new a uh, type of culture and different environment where uh, very different from the place where I'm coming from. Um, so if I'm coming from, you know, maybe very close to the things that uh, Avi is talking about, but everything that we do is uh, result driven, is measured, uh, you must have a business case behind that, etc, etc, etc. But from the other side, um, we you know, where you look for innovation, where you look where are the places where the big things happened, uh, this is on technology, on companies like us. So probably there are a lot of things that um, what we are trying to do here on the education side, we should learn from what happened on technology side and, um, and uh, take it to this area. Just uh, I'll try to adapt myself to the way that uh, Dove is <laughs> made his presentation because I'm learning here. So uh, I have a story and uh, I think that explains everything. Uh, this is with my daughter, she's 12 years old and uh, she, ha she had some kind of internet, inter, 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 <laughs> inter, inter, ship, yes? Yeah, there you go. Yeah, I got it. Uh, schools, at, uh, lessons at schools. And uh, they had to think about uh, some kind of, um, a problem that they want to solve, start with that. And she came back home and says, yeah, I have the problem. I, in, in the locker, I always forget what I left in my locker at school, what I have at home. When I prepare my bag for tomorrow, I have no idea, you know, what I should take with me. Usually, it creates a lot of difficulties later. So I will put a camera uh, in my locker, and I will always will know what 
what actually I have in the locker, and that's it, problem solved. And then I started, okay, so why camera? You should use a RFID uh, technology, and you'll have a wireless router uh, on the top of that, and um, will people pay for that? Uh, maybe how much they pay today for the, for the locker, and uh, they will add 50 shekels a year for that, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. And she looked at me and says, just homework, just, uh, you know, <laughs> leave me alone, you know. <laughs> so that's, uh, I think that's uh, just, uh, you know, a, the huge gap between the world that I'm coming from and where the people are actually, um, you know, exist today, the kids, what they learn, what they're trying to do. Hi, I'm Amalia. Uh, I'm the head of a mindset program. Uh, we're just going to finish our first court in uh, two weeks with a demo day. Um, like Socratic Labs, it's an accelerator with a combination of an uh, incubator because we are f we were facing the same issues that Heather mentioned before. Um, it's a short period to teach entrepreneurs with a back uh, background in technology, about pedagogy, about cognitive science, uh, and we think it's a must. In order to be an entrepreneur in EdTech, it's not enough to know that there is a gap between the where the kids are in the afternoons playing their mobile, watching the YouTube and learning uh, and all kinds of visual uh, um, appliances and apps. And then in school they sit and they sit in their rows and the teacher is giving them all the information she knows, which they can check on the same time if it's she's right or, or wrong. Um, uh, it's not enough. It's not enough to come with an idea how to close the gap. You have to actually try it on. Uh, in Mindset, we tried to, uh, we are trying uh, to introduce entrepreneurs uh, with teachers, uh, with researchers. Um, as I don't remember who said, uh, Alan said that. Of course, I know education. I was a student a long time <laughs> before. Or I have kids that are now studying. It's an instinct that we all feel. We know education. But there is a lot more to know than, than that. And in order to really make an impact in that field, you have to know more than technology. Technology is very, very important. But uh, to make a huge difference, we have to bridge the gap. I want to dive in and start uh, by some, some interesting uh, ideas that uh, Avi brought up, some interesting issues. Um, do you think that? startups that deal with education should go through the schools or take the other route or try and go through the app stores, try and go through the parents, not, not try and go through the school and become uh, like an official uh, system, but is it better today from what you see? This time last week I was at a conference in Dublin which was all about healthcare, which is arguably nothing to do with education, but it's actually exactly the same. And so in the healthcare world, uh, they have like doctors, whereas you guys have teachers. Um, they have patients, whereas we, you know, in schools you have uh, parents and, and students. They also have huge institutionalized bodies, governments involved in the funding of these projects. And you have a few organizations like the Pearsons of this world. In healthcare, you have GlaxoSmithKline and so on. So. Strangely, I've kind of come to the realization that it's exactly the same. And the way they do innovation, even the people in the large uh, pharmaceutical companies have recognized that it's, it's impossible to recreate a kind of innovation culture in a big organization. So they've kind of uh, got themselves interested in the startup world because it's cheaper, easier, certainly you can fail fast, as Heather was talking about, in that context than you can trying to do it through the traditional channels, if you like. And it seemed to me, just in the last few days, that that's exactly the same in the world of education. So it's possibly easier for a startup to do it on the outside, or at least experiment on the outside, before you start to go into it. Yeah, and, and healthcare and education are the two biggest, most ubiquitous markets in the world as well. Um, we actually use the case study of a vertical, of a, of a healthcare focused, healthcare vertical focused <laughs> accelerator program when we were talking to people about what we were doing. So um, so that's a really interesting question. Uh, we actually, I, I think it depends on the company and, and more importantly on the problem that the company is trying to solve. Uh, I, I think 
with venture capital, we see venture capital backing companies that are going direct to consumer more often than companies, uh, or at least early stage. Early stage VC money tends to come uh, in much more easily to companies who are selling directly to consumers. Growth stage money tends to go to to institutional sales companies, which I think that that's an interesting observation. Um, when we set up Socratic Labs, we actually were the first entity to really embrace K-12 schools. And that was, um, I, I, I think, so in, I, I don't know how familiar you, you are with the US, but I'm in New York. New York has a relatively young startup culture, but pretty vibrant. Um, and the West Coast or Silicon Valley is where most venture capital is and most entrepreneurship is, but it's now becoming, um, it's, it's happening everywhere. Uh, but the, the attitude in the Valley uh, as a friend of mine who runs an educational technology company in New York said, he said, uh, he went out there, he did a program out in the Valley, and he came back and he said, I had a great time in the Valley, I made a bunch of great contacts, but everyone in the Valley thinks that schools are the devil and that we should do everything we can to circumvent them. Um, and uh, you know, the reality is that most kids are still getting educated in schools, and there are huge problems to be addressed in schools, and that means also big market opportunities as well. There are a lot of idiosyncratic elements. Selling to schools is challenging. It's relationship-based. It's also time-consuming. But it's also a very predictable market. So once you, do, once you know what those hoops you have to jump through are, and you can get into schools, it's actually much easier to stay in schools where a consumer can cancel a subscription anytime. It's a lot, the, the, consumer end up, the consumer market ends up being a lot more fickle. Um, although it is a little bit easier to enter, it's still extremely fragmented and, and more fickle. Institutional sales may be more time consuming, but it's a beast that we understand, it's a beast we know. Um, so we, we actually have partnerships with K-12 organizations for that specific reason, but I think the more I interesting issue for us has been what do those business models then look like? And I think um, it, it really boils down to what the company is doing, and I think for us it's about the problem being solved. So we had a company that um, was building, uh, or did build and, and has a live application that levels books, and that means it aligns it to our curriculum. Um, in this A to Z fashion, in, in level of complexity of, of many different factors. Um, but whenever possible, we encourage our entrepreneurs to think about interesting business models. So that founder, that CEO, gives her technology away to teachers for free. And she sells that information to publishers. It's really valuable to publishers. And so I think even when you're working within the institutional model of schools, there are innovative ways you can think about getting uh, innovative business models that you can tap into. And I think the great thing is, is there's a lot of exploration happening now. There's a lot of experimentation happening. And I think we're going to see, um, I, I, I get calls from friends in the Valley often at, at VC firms who call me and say, hey, I've got this company and I put $6 million into them and now it's two years in and and this is a true story, by the way. It's two years in, and they have 600 users, and they have no money. Um, what can you talk to them? Uh, what, what do we do? And uh, my my advice was cut your ties, <laughs> get it back as much money as you can. Um, but I think that a lot of companies have tried to make things social models a lot because of the fear of schools and that institutional model. Companies have tried to implement social businesses, and you know, I said this the other day, but the reason Facebook and Twitter are free is because we, the users, are also the product. Um, and you cannot do that in education because it's, you're dealing with, uh, with minors, and you cannot sell their data. So um, with that said, there are a lot of, uh, if you can take a step back and say, we know the user is different from the customer, but in identifying who the customer might be, Think about who is getting value out of this implementation. I think that there are a lot of interesting business models that are emerging and will continue to emerge. I would maybe try to distinguish between uh, two type of audiences. I believe that uh, for the K-12 audiences, I would rather go uh, through the traditional educational system, through the schools, and I'm going to talk about it in a minute. But for college students, I believe it's uh, better, and there are already successes in going direct to consumers. The main differences are two. First of all, the college students are willing to pay for, uh, so there is a business model for the company that goes directly to the consumers at the college stage. Actually, they are paying a fraction of what they 
had to pay if they went to regular colleges. So going directly to college students will be a viable business model and companies can scale. You know, today you can be in Israel and actually sell to Chinese or to Americans or to Germans. So with the infrastructure that we have today, you don't want to have to be in on the ground in order to sell technology or to sell uh, courses all over the world. When it comes to the K-12 system, I believe there are two things to think about. The first one, I believe, it's the trust of the parents and the trust of the kids to get. So if, if you sell directly to kids, actually the parents have to pay for it. They're already paying enough for the schools, so there is no extra budget to pay for that directly, and they also miss the trust aspect and the credibility aspect of the educational system. I believe that the best way to go to K-12, even though it may take a little bit longer, is actually what we call B2B2C. It's actually to <coughs> sell through the educational system, but then to scale up with the adoption of the kids, of the students. And in order to, for that to happen, actually you need also to impact the kids through other, either give them some free tools or some free things like uh, the free the free things uh, given to the teacher. I believe that drives the demand, but the end result and the business, the re really reliable business model will be or only through the schools. Otherwise, I believe it will be a waste of time. So partner with the schools, scale with the students, that will be the right business model for Cal 12. And another interesting uh, uh, point I think that came up is that uh, one of the big differences is that most of the people here that are founders in educational startups um, are different from traditional uh, founders. In in a major way, I've been I've been a founder, and I can say that uh, I started the company because I wanted to be rich, uh, and it's more about greed than anything else. Uh, so I, I think that when you're in a startup in, in an educational type of a startup, it, it it's not the greed that drives you to start it. It's something else. Now, I, I'm not saying uh, all, all entrepreneurs are greedy as me. So, some also want to be famous. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> it's rich and famous. But, but I think that, that uh, to me, maybe, maybe I'm uh, romanticizing here, but I think that uh, uh, people that have a new educational idea uh, probably more important for them to make the change in the world, to make the change in the education, than to make money for themselves. And you know, I've been an entrepreneur and I'm dealing with entrepreneurship now for over 35 years. I believe the main driver for entrepreneurs is to make an impact. I believe uh, if you want to make an impact, then the other things will be a result of that. You make an impact, you get, you know, first of all, you get your satisfaction, but eventually, you know, some of the people that make an impact also will make money. But I believe that the main driver of an uh, entrepreneur is actually to make an impact on something. Now, there is no better place to make an impact on an old conservative system that hasn't been changed for the last 50 years. So there is room for uh, you know, disruptiveness, there is room for change, there is room for innovation. Some of those people you know, will end up uh, richer, some of them, of them will end up more satisfied, and, some of, and most of them will fail. But I don't believe that uh, the education sector is different from any other sector. You know, if, you want, if you're an entrepreneur, you're an entrepreneur. And definitely you need to have a, an idea, you need to have passion, you need to have resilience, you need to have the willingness to go throughout that roller coaster of entrepreneurship, and we have been there. But I don't see any difference between entrepreneurs in the education system, entrepreneurs in the financial services system, or the healthcare system, or even the communication system. You know, I don't see any difference. And I've been in many, many industries. I started my career in one of the most conservative industries, financial services. I was an entrepreneur, and since then I was involved in many, many failures, but also many, many successes in what we called FinTech, not EdTech, FinTech. And believe me, the financial services industry is as conservative as educational. And there are very similarities. I fully agree with Alan, there are similarities between the healthcare system, but there are also similarities between the financial services sector and the educational sector being conservative, uh, trust issue, credibility issue, regulation, many, many, many similarities. Uh, but you know, 
What drives innovation in uh, the financial services is actually the user's demand. Users can't, you know, my kids, they are grown up kids, they've never stepped into a bank's branch. Never. And believe me, they do transactions, things like that. <laughs> Because they style of life, so banks have to adapt to changing customers' behavior. And the same will happen in the educational system. The educational system will have to adapt to new ways of doing business, and there is a lot of room for innovation. I agree with what you said, but, but, but in real life, if there is an education entrepreneur here that walks into your office and is more, you feel that he's so passionate about the educational side of things, and he's really completely undriven by the money aspect of things. I mean, you, you as a financial investor, somebody that manages other people's money, you have to be concerned with, with this approach that uh, where really it's more about making an impact and maybe when the decision will come whether to uh, do an exit or to keep on going, maybe uh, uh, this person can uh, basically, because the different set of values that you have for educational startup, and again, this is maybe one place where education is different than mobile banking, financial, because really I think the entrepreneurs are really changing the world maybe in a more fundamental way or are more touched by it. I don't know exactly how, but Rightly so, you know, uh, we see maybe thousands of uh, startup companies a year and we invest only about five to six years. So definitely we don't invest in everything that comes, walks into our offices. And definitely we are looking for something that eventually will create value. You know, value for the entrepreneurs first and foremost, and then if they will make value, we will make value, you know. Venture capitalists are actually a service organization. We service entrepreneurs, we service investors, and uh, if the two, uh, if these, these two stakeholders are going to make money, we eventually make money, and you have to understand that. So, if there is no business model and the company is not going to be big, impactful, and you know, not necessarily on monetization, you know, we have many many companies that do have value by just having a user base, Instagram, Waze, others. There is a value to that as well, not by selling the product, but selling a service or meeting a need can be a social need. But uh, eventually we are looking, as venture capitalists, as professional money manager, we are looking for value creation that has an economical value creation rather than an educational value creation. But I am one of those naive persons that believe that there is a direct connection between uh, value or the system that you are trying or the sector that you are trying to impact and financial value. Well, I, I also think it's really important to remember that an entrepreneur does not necessarily mean a venture-backed entrepreneur. Um, I, I know people who've started and run big nonprofits who are extremely entrepreneurial in the way they think and the way they operate. Their organizations um, are, are very, um, you know, for one instance, Nifty, the Network for Teaching Entrepreneurship, big uh, U.S.-based nonprofit that teaches kids entrepreneurships, but they also they run programs all over the world. I mean, it's the core of their organization, really. And and so I think I agree there. You know, venture investors, whether that's an angel investor or a venture fund, want that return, but. Um, but entrepreneurs come in all sizes and shapes and, and stripes and, and have different motivations. With that said, I think we do run into more entrepreneurs in education who probably shouldn't be running venture-backed businesses, and that's okay. Um, I think our obsession, it, it's great that venture capital and startups are so popular right now, but one of the things that I spend a lot of time doing um, with companies that are interested in our program or individuals who come to participate in our programs that are for the community beyond our accelerator is talk to them about the right model for their companies and help them figure out whether or not they should seek venture funding. And more often than not, the answer is no. Um, because th there are great businesses to be built and there are no shortage of problems to be solved in education, but not all of them are going to be 100x returns or, or even 10x returns, and that's perfectly fine. Um, and so for us, our model for the accelerator was, you know, it was very hard for us to think about our own structure, but we set up as a for-profit because um, it, it was hard for us because we, you know, we have interest and, and social alignment with a lot of foundations, but, um, you know, we wanted to invest in and, and not constantly be fundraising for our own organization. So uh, the, the driving 
decision in terms of the community though is we wanted to show great education entrepreneurs that they could make a really healthy living building great companies that solve big problems for a lot of people um and so and so i think it's it comes down to the dna of the company what is again it so much boils down to what is the problem you're trying to solve uh, i'd like to inject a little skepticism to about everything was said right now i don't think entrepreneurs change the world artists change the world Writers change the world. Inventors change the world. Entrepreneurs are something completely different. And not all entrepreneurs from Gustav Eiffel to uh, uh, great minds uh, still working today are, come from a, a meeting with investors and bankers. And uh, exactly just like Heather just said, uh, you could have a great idea and decide to go to a government or to turn it to a non-profit organization. And you still will change uh, the lives of a lot of pupils and students around the world. And uh, that doesn't change anything if you have the greed factor or not. This is irrelevant uh, if, you, if you make money or not. Because uh, I do believe uh, that uh, in the end, uh, great ideas win. It's not very important what the source of the investment was. And I'm not sure that the private sector is the right sector to be built upon to change the world of school. I, I'm not sure it's the right sector uh, to say, well, it doesn't really, I don't really care if it's a communication company or, or, or a school. I, I personally think there is a big difference between the two. And uh, um, uh, uh, on, for example, in San Francisco, there's, there's a great uh, entrepreneur who happens to be a, a writer, and his name is, is Dave Eggers, and uh, he has a non-profit organization uh, that completely changed uh, really the schools in very poor sectors of, of San Francisco. And he, he wanted to go uh, really to, to, to banks and to investors, and, and in the end it was much easier uh, to have a dialogue with donors and philanthropy organization than with the banks or, or, or the funds. And uh, I do believe that more and more people in the education system that have a great idea for the school would like to, would love to work with the schools, with the teachers, with the parents, and sometimes the investors and the funds uh, would be an obstacle and not really the great guy to partner with. Yeah, no, that, I think that's a really excellent point because uh, if you go back to the, the intelligences we were talking about, I think it's the same type of intelligence that creates a piece of music, creates a picture, uh, or comes up with an idea for a product. So actually the two things are the same. I also think that in, in history, most of the famous artists and painters and architects and so on were funded by private money, albeit not VCs as we know them. But, you know, so the institutions, I don't know who built the Eiffel Tower. Was it the French government? I doubt it. No, no, no. Okay, so... It's, it's a kind of privatized thing. Uh, I would also say, like, you know, in terms of entrepreneurship and setting out to, to create a company, uh, if you're doing it for the money, do not, do not do it for the money because you won't make any money is, is the logical fact. You, you, will, you will lose money. So please <coughs> don't get carried away with that. People, as we saw in the research there, like, entrepreneurs do generally do things for some uh, desire to make an impact or change not just the world but maybe their own community um, and so while we're on the funding thing I mean uh, we're, I'm involved in an organization called Coda Dojo which doesn't have a bank account founded by a guy who was 16 at the time so frustrated by the fact that he broke into a jail broke into a Nintendo games machine and he didn't there were he had loads of geeky friends online and so on but nobody in his school was interested in fact, you know, he was kind of abused and bullied at school. Uh, but he was luckily so frustrated by the idea that this wasn't good that he managed to find somebody um, in, in, in my organization as it happens. And we said, look, we'll, we'll, what can we do? We, did, we weren't going to give him any money. Uh, so we just set up this completely voluntary free organization, which, as we speak, is involved in uh, helping 30,000 young kids around the world learn to do a bit of programming. But it's entirely voluntary. Uh, there's, we don't, it doesn't have a bank account, there's no money involved, it's all free. So there's a kind of alternative model. I recruit all his friends and they changed school completely and now it's uh, the, I think it's the preferred uh, method to teach in school. 
So it came from business. On the other side, if we look at the Lean Startup me uh, methodology, I think it's uh, basically it came from the educational world because this is how the science uh, got advanced. Mm -hmm. You give an assumption, you check it, then you see if it's prolonged, uh, you go with it furthermore, or it's, uh, it's not true anymore. So I think the combination is disruptive. It's, uh, yeah, it's disruptive, and either it comes from art or from business, uh, or from education, it, it makes the innovation. That's what we're looking for. I think, I th well, for me, it's kind of, uh, when the startup culture meets education, the the thing that happened now is that the, the startup culture changes because usually when you talk about startup in Israel, it's focused on how we get money, how we raise money, how, what's the financing. And now when you talk about education, suddenly startups don't have to have financial investors. They can be other ways of creating a startup and making an impact. I mean, I think that here in Israel, we're a bit, uh, m maybe because we have so much venture capital funding, really, le relative to the side of the industry, kind of creates a bias towards, okay, everything goes uh, the VC way, so we have... <laughs>